Okay, um, welcome to our session on sexuality and design. Um, the Wolverhampton School of Art has a group called ABLE. ABLE was ably named by our own Martin Evans. It was a response by a group of staff and student representatives to the challenge of attainment for all. We decided that attainment could only be achieved through students and staff feeling a sense of belonging, through learning, and importantly here, learning was for both students and staff, and by students and staff feeling a sense of equality. We came together in response to a culture in higher education that promotes targets, often statistics, not methods. And so in this vacuum of how we get from here to there, ABLE was born. We wanted to make plans, put plans into action, do research, put research into action, and then create positive change. But first we realized that we needed to talk, we needed to converse, not just any old way, but openly, honestly, earnestly, and bearing good intentions in mind with forgiveness for our occasional thoughtlessness and blunders. We do this with you now. This event has grown from personal stories into one that asks the question of the relationship between sexuality and design in particular. But in addition to that, and perhaps built into this question, are others about the role of the university art school within communities, the purpose of an education in art and design, and the relationship between designer and user, and perhaps ultimately what design is and what it could be. We're all going to briefly introduce ourselves. Then I will ask questions of our panel drawn from what we have wanted to find out. We're not sure we'll be actually answering, providing answers, but we just want to start the questions. So please feel free to put comments, ask questions, um, provide answers yourselves, make suggestions. Keep the chat going um, and then 15 minutes to go, we'll, we'll open it up into discussion as well. So we'll try and represent what you're saying in the chat as we go along too. So hopefully we've only got an hour today, but this will hopefully be the start of something else. Okay, can I invite Nandini first? Hello everyone, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I am Nandini, uh, Nandini Moitra. I am from Kolkata, India. I'm an artist and uh, illustrator and also an activist. So my pronouns are they, them. So uh, what I mostly do is I also have co-founded a queer art collective here in Kolkata. So the idea behind that was that uh, our histories, especially queer histories, in the South Asian context have been lost. So we've been trying to reimagine those histories and archive those histories and also be able to give a safe space to queer and trans artists. And uh, as for my own personal work, I really, uh, I work with mythology and queerness, reinventing mythology. I work with spaces, um, I, spaces and also how certain spaces are, uh, are safe for queer people. And mostly I like to see, show queer utopias, be it like queer people just being in their own homes. So, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Fernandez. I'm one of the 3D design lecturers at the University of Wolverhampton. My pronouns are he, him, his. And um, what I was going to say to you guys is what we're presenting to you today is what the answers I'll be um, answering is from my own personal experience. Um, <clears throat> so I have got a very wide range of creativity from where I originated from. Uh, I am from Kenya in Africa. Uh, and I'll be talking a lot about kind of my journey through design and how my sexuality has affected it. Uh, I started off as uh, a fine artist back in Kenya, 
And that's what got me to think about design. Uh, that led me to move to the UK to do product design. And then finally, when I came out, I embraced interior design. But I'll talk a bit more about that later on. I do also have a side business that I do uh, baking of French macarons and wedding cakes. Um, and so I just want to kind of emphasize this element of creativity and breaking down these walls that we have around us. So I'll talk a bit more in detail as we go along. Thanks, Jane. Hello everybody, um, my name is Gavin Rogers. Um, I'm an artist and an art lecturer at the Wolverhampton School of Art as well. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. And I guess my, my journey and the reason for me being here is I am a, I am a queer person, um, I identify as a gay man. And also um, having realizing that there's a direct connection between my work and my sexuality. And although it might not seem obvious, and when I came out the closet in my early 20s, I started making a lot of my artwork changed and it started becoming more activist. And that activism has now spanned into all sorts of areas. Um, so this piece of work, for instance, the, the stalk, um, is work that is about migration from Eastern Europe to the UK. And my partner's from Bulgaria as well. And the stalk is a symbol of like birth and youth and um, um, hope and good luck. And... Um, so, and then this one here was um, an eel on wheels, uh, which is also quite a queer looking object. And that's about the, the way that our cities have become um, places for tax evasion. And, it, and often the most vulnerable people end up at the bottom of that, that fight against tax evasion. And like the way that leaseholds and landlords deal with their finance. So um, in some ways, I don't know if my, my artwork is... I think activist in some way and that definitely stems from a sense of queer solidarity um, the elephant is about unspoken issues around alcoholism and the donkey is this idea of um, protecting land and communities because donkeys are actually used whether you know this or not um, they, they're put alongside horses to protect them and cattle and they'll also fight off wolves and all sorts of other creatures if they come near this land and this um, livestock so yeah, this idea of, of I feel like I have a, a responsibility and a, and the longing to help other people, um, and that's part of my practice. And, and it'll be interesting to know what how that links into um, sexuality design and that process in general. So thank you. Hello, I'm Jane Webb. Um, I'm a contextual studies lecturer and also um, one of the deputy heads at the School of Art. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm straight and I think these events are important for everybody, um, not just people in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, my background is in anthropology um, and I currently, um, research the history of clothing um, and I don't just mean clothing that's um, sort of abstract concept but actual garments that people have worn and so I look at I try and find out about individuals through their clothing and um, recently um, one of the things I was really thinking about was colour in relation to that and why boys wore pink in the colonial period. So that's what I was um, researching. Okay, so enough about us. Well, though I'm sure it'll all be about us as well <laughs> and you, um, but I wanted to ask the first question really, and I suppose it's, it's quite a big one. Um, what is sexuality? Um, and why is it important for us to think about in relation to design? I don't know if anyone wants to start on that one. I'll go first. Um, for me, I think sexuality represents freedom for me. And it was when I finally came out, my sexuality almost became me and became my freedom. And that's why I think when I think of designers, we have this ability to be as free as possible and allow that creativity to come out. And that's why I think it's really important to kind of 
put these these two together to almost try and understand that that freedom in your creative being comes from your freedom in yourself and not just for a, a queer person but for anyone um, your sexuality does influence that freedom of yourself so and Jamie? so um what gavin said makes a lot of sense like sexuality being freedom but i also feel that sexuality is not just about desire. So sexuality is so much uh, all encompassing. It's like whether we come out or not, it's a part of us and somehow it will always come out in our creativity. It will always be there. That's why the first time I saw pictures of like the Sistine Chapel, I was like, I'm pretty sure Michelangelo was queer. And then I Googled him and he was queer. So, uh, and uh, so what happens, especially in art is that uh, the queerness of these artists are often either, uh, it's either glazed over or no one talks about it. Or somebody is like, why do we need to call them? A, I've heard this very often. Why don't do you call yourself a queer artist? Why not just an artist? So the uh, I think my answer to that is often that uh, as a queer artist, because of my content, often there are these walls which are there, which I might not have had to face if I wasn't queer, if I was a cis head man. So. Uh, the, in that way, claiming our sexuality also gives us ownership over our own work so that no one else can define our work, no one else. In fact, what often happens is that like there is so much of co-option of like uh, uh, queer culture. So like a lot of things is borrowed from uh, trans sex workers in like pop culture, be it like... Uh, be it fashion design or be it makeup. In fact, the whole highlighting thing comes from drag queens. So these people from whom it has been taken from and co-opted from, they never get credit for it. So it's almost like, you know, it's almost like saying this is who I am. And uh, I am proud to say that I am a queer artist. And, uh, and like you cannot erase that from me. So I think that also comes through. And also, if you look at uh, design, uh, even fine arts in general, like in my Indian context, of, you know, when I went to college here for a while. And uh, so art colleges here were set up by the British to teach Indians to make maps. So even now, it is this extremely like excruciating process of drawing everything just the way it is. And the, it gives no, like there is no room for creativity. And that is how the entire thing was built. The entire curriculum was built because of colonialism. And uh, it also, what happened was that a lot of like, if you look at the colonial art in India, it's very sexual, like especially Indian miniatures, it's extremely sexual. There's so many depictions of queerness, homosexuality, transsexuality, a lot of things. But uh, these things were sanitized because of Victorian social norms. And somehow we also like internalized it as a society. And which is the reason like, you know, it's still frowned upon. So, I think when you look at like sexuality and design of sexuality and art, it's also important to look at our own individual histories, like individual histories as people and also our collective histories. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. Catherine, did you want to say something about that question before I go um, back to yeah, Nandini? Yeah, I think just a really, really, really quick point. I think I agree with what Nandini was saying about this idea of sanitation. And like um, that often things get removed from history and our bodies are starved of certain um, things and our spaces and stuff. And I was just going to, I was just saying, thinking that 
for me, design is about space, body and culture. Like those three things should be considered when you're making art or you're designing something. Um, and for so long, the spaces and the bodies and the cultures that were being represented, I think existed for certain places, certain times, certain people. So sexuality and design is about allowing more people to use their bodies in the way they want to use them, to make the sounds they want to make, um, to be in the spaces they want to be in. Um, and it, that relates to Jason's point about freedom. So yeah, it's, it's thinking more considerately, how can everyone be included in this future history, which is a bit of a weird thing to say, yeah. but like it, that's kind of what I'm sort of suggesting or maybe. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. And I really am intrigued by future history because obviously as a contextual lecturer, I teach history, but, and that's really one of the reasons why, to, to some of the people in the audience, in fact, and it's one of the reasons why I've really been keen to think about how sexuality works with design because I want to be able to talk about it. I, I think from, I mean, what's been interesting in what you've just spoken about, all of you, is that from a, from a, a personal sense of freedom, we're talking about a very clear relationship between the individual and society um, in terms of the the aspects of society that impact on the understanding of the person's own self. And I wanted to come to Nandini um, and ask whether they could talk about their experience in India um, and the relationship of gender and, and sexuality to the colonial context in a bit more detail, particularly around uh, kind of labeling of bodies. So, um... So other than being an artist, I'm also an activist. And in fact, like because of my class and cast privilege, sometimes uh, growing up, I did not know of the terms uh, that existed, like uh, 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 what do you say, uh, colloquial terms of like uh, of like different genders and sexualities, the, like poti, hijra. There are many terms uh, which describe queerness. So what has happened with colonialism is that there are a lot of people who do not have access to English, right? And they're not, uh, so because they do not have access to English, like queerness is seen as this like construct which has come from the West, but these categories, these people, they've existed. They've always existed. So there is also, a kind of like erasure of these identities which have existed for centuries. So, um, so what has happened is that uh, again, like by getting back to the whole sa sanitizing project that, of like queerness, that you have to be this upper class, upper caste, uh, English speaking person to be able to be queer. So, like in fact, there was this horrible like uh you know, horrible campaign on uh, facebook called uh, not a hijra so hijra uh, uh, gharanas are basically these uh, houses in which trans women mostly live together and uh, they basically earn their living by sex work or by getting blessings giving blessings in exchange for money and it's basically a religious role right so that uh, like the label of hijra is seen as something really like the look down in society so uh, so like there is this it's okay to be a trans woman who has medic medically transitioned but it's not okay to be hijra or koti so that way the whole colonial construct construct of like this entire thing of lgbt also comes in so who gets represented? Who gets talked about? In fact, when you uh, like, even when you Google LGBT activists in India, you will mostly see like upper caste, upper classes, gay men. But I know so many like incredible, incredible, like some people I have the privilege to work with 
like uh, her name is Raina Roy. Like I feel like I have learned most of my like gender theory and everything from her. So rather than from books, so like lived. I feel like uh, sexuality, especially. I think uh, a lot of uh, people should really look at lived experiences rather than like or going back to academic texts because often lived experiences would be able to tell the story like the way it is rather than yeah i think i mean it's really interesting that not only we're then talking about sexuality we're talking about colonial structures, we're talking about class, we're talking about all sorts of different and caste, all sorts of different intermeshed um, issues. Can I come to Jason really to talk about, because I think your concern is around gender and sexuality in those relationships. It is, yes. Um, I've got a few slides, Jane, so I'll tell oh, you okay. when to go. Yeah. Uh, um, we just go to the first one. But first of all, I'd like to kind of ask everyone in the audience, we, we come across this kind of uh, word privilege quite a lot. And recently we've heard the word privilege a lot. And it's not just based on ethnicity or kind of what you have in your bank balance. But if you think, if you ask yourself the question, when was the last time you had to tell somebody what your sexuality was? Um, or when was the last time you were walking down the street and you had to think twice before you reached out to hold your partner's hand? We do live in a society where we are very progressive, but at the same time, there is instances where, as a gay man living in the UK, I am asking myself these questions every time um, because there are areas that you go to where you can't do that. So privilege comes from that element of how much do you have compared to what someone else has, that freedom? And for a, a queer person, coming out is something we have to do every day. Almost every time I meet a new group of people, I have to come out in a way. It wasn't as hard when I came out at the age of 24. That was the hardest time. But this coming out has a massive element. But I'll go back to like my background with uh, growing up in Kenya. Um, my ethnicity is Indian. Uh, we have Goan heritage, which means there's Portuguese in us, which has meant my religion has been Catholicism. Catholicism is very strong. And the way we were brought up was to understand that being gay is a bad word. Queer is a bad word. I've always been fearful of these words. And so it's been a very unnatural thing. I've been told it's very unnatural to be like this my whole life. So that coming out was a huge, huge step. And because I came out quite late at 24, uh, there was a lot in, ingrained in me. And I think it's to do a lot with my, my gender and what boys were perceived to be or what girls were perceived to be. And if we just go to the next slide, Jane, if you don't mind. I will try and get there, thank you. Thank you, thanks. Um, <laughs> There's a great article. If you go to lettoysbetoys.org.uk, in 2015, there was an article about toys and the advertising of toys. And it was incredible to see the billions that are spent on this industry that really influence parents and society in what the male gender should be and what the female gender should be. The male gender is utilitarian. Um, the female gender is aesthetics and appearance. And this does relate to the design element. If you we know in our school, interior design, fashion is we attract a lot more female students into those courses. Why is that? Uh, there's a fantastic program uh, called No More Boys and Girls. Uh, it's on YouTube. If you have a look, it's a two-part series. And they did this experimentation with two classes of seven-year-old kids. And it's incredible to see how young boys are fearful of expressing themselves. And for me, I put myself in that category because that is where I was grown up in and I was fearful of that. So 
if you look at the Kinder Bueno egg, I remember being in a, a supermarket once here in the UK, and there was a mother with her probably three or four year old boy, and he wanted a, a Kinder Bueno egg that was on the side. And she's like, go on, take one. And he went, reached out to grab one, and he picked a pink egg. And the first thing she said was, stop it. What, what do little boys have? And he was like blue so he put the pink one down and picked up blue and that's not the mother's fault it's not the little boy's fault it is the way society has ingrained in us what boys and girls should be so if we go to the next one jane if you Sorry. don't mind it's all right um so i started my uh, university degree as a product designer when I look back, I know for a fact that I held back to what I was kind of talking about. I designed a baby buggy for my final major project. But even in that, I looked at car design and automotive design to get my aesthetic and my understanding of this industry, which was a baby industry. Uh, when I went to work, I, I worked with some great clients like Jaguar and Fine and Country. But again, I was holding back. I, was, I wanted to be invisible. I did not want to be seen. My anxiety, my depression kind of held my creativity down. And it kind of, when you think about uh, the male suicide rate, I fell into that. I kind of attempted these many times because of being suppressed in creativity, being suppressed in my, what my sexuality was. So I think that does go back to gender. So if we go to the next one. I was then started to open my eyes up to other designers. And you have Karim Rashid on the left, who is a straight designer, but almost embraces metrosexuality and talks about how you, this freedom allows you to be creative in different industries, not just interior, not just product. Um, and then we have Lee Broom, who is a, a gay designer, but he started off as a fashion designer, moved into product, moved into <clears throat> furniture, and now is one of the leading kind of interior designers in the UK. And again, those barriers are just washed away. So <clears throat> that allowed me to really, really come out and express myself as a designer. And if we go to the next one, it kind of shows how I started to embrace, I did a master's at Wolverhampton and Wolverhampton as a school really promotes this element of being true to yourself and being, allowing what society has to offer and the challenges society has, you tackle those. Um, and I did that. And what I brought to my companies that I worked with was new markets, new industries. It was interesting to see how clients, when they approached me or when I approached them, they were so accepting of me and my ideas because I was proud of what I was presenting. So my design got totally transformed because I opened up to my sexuality and I embraced it. Um, so it, it is very, it's honest design in my eyes. And then finally, uh, about two years ago, I finally owned my own apartment. I bought my own apartment. And um, thank you, Jane. And I decided what Nandini spoke about, a, a, a place, a safe space. And my apartment was my safe space. No one is going to judge me. I don't care what I do in that or what I don't do in that apartment. And that was my place of sanctuary. And I do have my kitchen is totally black. Uh, there's elements of bold kind of straight lines in there. That's part of me. I'm not ashamed of that part, but I'm also not ashamed of this kind of elaborate uh, plethora of I have my corridor is totally pink with cherry blossom on the top but that is who I am and I want to be proud of that creativity so even with my students I want them to all straight gay queer whatever you are embrace yourself be proud of yourself and allow that creativity to come out so I have friends back in Kenya who are, are gay are queer and I see them suppressing this creativity because they have to, because of the society they live in. So hopefully that will inspire a few people in the audience. I mean, that is incredibly inspiring. And I have to say a gorgeous sort of environment. And, and 
I think I know we we have talked because we've tried to not have a conversation before, haven't we? So that we could have the conversation yeah. today. But we've talked very much about um, spaces and the relationship between feeling a sanctuary space and uh, you know the public space, which is quite a different environment. And I just wanted to to ask um, Gavin about this because I think. Um, questions around how, how does design, how do designed material things, how are they promoting heteronormativity? Um, I think that is an, that's an excellent question to start off with. Um, so, so much to say, I just, I just want to thank um, Jason and Nandini so far as well. I think what, what they've been saying, um, Nandini about lived experience, and like representing that in some way. And also this idea of creating a safe space. And Jason, your flat looks amazing. <laughs> and it puts my Ikea Billy bookcase. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, um, what is, I guess, this idea of the interior space and interior design and intimate objects, like um, me, myself, when I see stuff on Instagram, I think, oh, I, wouldn't, I think the person that made that might be, might be LGBTQAIP plus, um, you know. Um, and usually sometimes they are, and, and, and that's the kind of a feeling, a sense of um, this feels comforting, familiar, um, like a, something that I wanna buy or a safe space that I could be in. And I do agree that the inside in our homes, particularly for LGBT um, people or queer people, become a safe space. Also, maybe that's because the outside isn't a safe space as well. And that's another big question and, and an area which I think should be discussed more because although we live in these silos of creativity and we have our little queer communities and I'm sure that our friends we like to be around like-minded people um, and there are many um, also straight people that are amazing and fantastic and fabulous too and that's also just to highlight that again um, but the world is still designed for a heteronormative um, top-down I won't say totalitarianism if that's not the right word but it has its kind of a Hannah R. Dents, a philosopher who writes about the, um, totalitarianism, this sense that there is an order. And if you don't fit that order, you are not going to feel comfortable. And the only way we can truly kind of be free is to have a sense of political autonomy and activism over the societies that we create, which allow people to be what they want to be. Um, so I think we really need to reconsider who designs our cities, who designs, who, who are our politicians, who are the world leaders, who, who decides what kind of trade and manufacturing exists in India. It shouldn't be the British and the Americans. It should be people in India, perhaps. Like um, start to hand power to people from all backgrounds and all sexualities. Um, so then I, hopefully you can be outside in a public space and feel comfortable there too, um, because I think you need a, a multiple minds to work on these projects to create spaces that feel um, safe for people. It reminds me of a text, which I'm not promoting my event right tomorrow, but I'm going to do a reading at three o'clock, which is um, um, Johanna Hedvart, they, them. Um, it's a text that they did about called Sick Woman, um, which is a text that, suggests that the only way you can function in society is to be like a, a well, healthy, heteronormative person. Um, and if you're sick or you're unwell or you're different or you're, you have a learning disability or you're female or you're, you're identified as female or, or you're LGBT plus, you're kind of on the edges trying to get through barriers, even if they're small for some people or they're really big for other people. The barriers are still are still there, um, and I think the only way that we can change that is to question the books that we read. Um, you know, change our friends' minds and have conversations about these things. Work with, you know, br bring artists and city planners together. Like try and create these really collaborative, joined up ways of thinking. Um, I mean, there are some historical texts as well. Um, I was thinking about John Ruskin, who love or hate them as, as a writer about architecture. And um, there's, a, there's a nice sort of element where he describes nature as being female. And actually, if, if this nature was able to design the cities or cities were more feminine, 
um, then maybe our cities would be very different places to live instead of the, the reality of the high rise, the concrete, um, the JD Ballard, Ballard kind of stuff, um, which actually could work, but it needs to be reconsidered through the eyes of more people, I think. Um, so that, yeah, I'm not, I'm going into all sorts of utopian territories here, but to, in order to create a utopia, you really need to allow people to be free. And the problem with utopias is often they come with constraints. <laughs> Um, well, and I, I who think decides that, I guess. Utopia means nowhere, doesn't it? And and mm. you know that that's quite an interesting question, isn't it? In that, how do we? I mean, how do we become inclusive? I, I think it's really interesting that you su are talking about public and private space, because a lot of our public space is privatized. So I mm. think there is obviously a, a relationship, isn't there, between capitalism and, and the way that cities are organized. Um, <clears throat> there is also, I was thinking about when you were talking about nature, that the, Judy Atfield in her book um, said, you know, the, the formula form follows function could be form female follows function male, you know, so there is, I think a set of dichotomies, isn't there always about you're either one thing or the other. Can we get beyond that? How do we get beyond that? I suppose I just wanted to ask my question about queer and queering, because I think it's an interesting term. Um, and maybe that can bring us into that area before we talk more to the audience or hopefully the audience talks more to us. Um, many designers, artists, theorists, theorists use the words queer and queering as a verb. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to say, what does that mean to us? How might we think of that as a process within art and design practice and education, perhaps? Um, <laughs> I, might, I might jump in there. Um, okay. Just to say, first of all, that queer is, is often quite a, traditionally quite a Western word. So I think we just have to acknowledge that to okay, start off yeah. with. And, it, and it, in the UK in particular, it had quite negative connotations and meanings. Um, oh, that person's a bit queer, like they're a bit weird, they're a bit, um, you know, a bit gay, a bit ducky, like all these words that my grandmother would use. Um, but I think the reason that it's being used more now is that people are starting to own that word in more of a like political activist kind of way and say, actually, to be queer means to be different or an other. And I mean, I guess the, the ideal goal is for everyone to celebrate other ultimately. And that's maybe what queering and queer is, is aiming to do in some way. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's very different for every person. Um, Sorry, I, I agree totally, Gavin. Um, I think the word queer, like I mentioned, when I was growing up, I was fearful of that word. But the people who I saw were queer, were different. And to me, to be different to what is in society is to be strong and have strength in you. Um, when I see somebody in drag or dressing, like you look at Harry Styles, for instance, um, and you look at that kind of energy or strength to be able to be different um, is to me, bring that into your design and your artwork to be bold in your design and your artwork. And that is different to be unique. Uh, so yeah, I completely agree. I think that different is a very, different is not a bad thing. It's, it's an incredible thing, so. Could I say something? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of uh, the things that Gavin was saying uh, makes a lot of sense the way like, how our cities are built and like if it could be more feminine. But it also brings me back to one thing, like if you look at most of like event planning, fashion design, design in general, it's dominated, makeup, it's dominated by queer people. But uh, do they often get acknowledged? Like, this really struck me. I was watching some really like uh, 
you know, a garbage show about like Indian weddings. And uh, I realized that most of the people behind the scenes, be it the wedding planning, the designers, the makeup artists, the, uh, what do you say, the sets, everything is done by queer people. So queer people are putting in all this labor for designing weddings for straight people in a country where queer people are not allowed to get married. <laughs> so, uh, like, so their labor is being used, their aesthetics are being used, but they are, you know, they're just somebody behind the scenes. Yes. So I think this is also like, uh, you know, uh, Jason spoke about Harry Styles, like, uh, person, uh, uh, a trans person, uh, a trans non-binary person said that. So Harry, of course, like it's brilliant that Harry Styles, uh, you know, is so comfortable uh, with themselves and it sends a very positive message, but also like, but there is, on the other hand, if there is a trans woman or she is abused, or like a non-binary femme, they are abused to no end, like from death threats to all sorts of things, to no end for the exact same thing. So I think my question here would be like, how do we also give credit for like, to the queer people who have been creating for so long, and never get the kind of recognition that they deserve. And uh, yeah. I was reading an article by um, John Potvin is his name. Um, and it was about, it was called the pink elephant in the room and it was about interior design history. And it mm. said exactly that thing, which was, you know, queer people have been interior designers quite famously for a long time yet interior design history seems not to have been touched by any change at all. And so, I mean, exactly as, as you've said, Nandini, and I think in some ways that's potentially what queering should be doing, isn't it? It's not about just an identity. It is about uh, addressing the structures that keep these identities so separate and so oppositional. Um, mm. and, and those are the very basis, really, of what we should be doing in terms of histories and, you know, futures. It, it's, it's that which is the process that's so important, I think. And how we go about that in a university setting is something that I'm very interested to, it, to kind of work on. It, it's I a bit like, uh, uh, oh, sorry, do you want to say something, Nandini? No, no, uh, just one line. So I think uh, how we should queer spaces is the way we, what we did to the word queer, like queer was a slur, but then we made it our own and we started owning it uh, as a badge of honor. So I think that is how like queering spaces should follow the same process of how we queered the word queer so yeah I was just gonna say um as you were talking there I was imagining like a wedding a cake basically and Jason as an avid baker and um I'm sure you'll appreciate this but I think often the, the queer community are there to like ice the cake and make it look pretty at the end but actually we want a bit of the cake and we want to help make the cake and bake the cake and, you know, maybe even like help on the farm to get the eggs and be allowed to be on the farm, you know, like that it's about the whole thing, not just ice in the, the cake. I hope that made sense. In my head, it does. Did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a quote actually from Ease Kosofsky um, Sedgwick. I don't know if you're familiar, um, but I was really struck by this, the a definition of, of queer as the open mesh of possibilities, gaps, overlaps, dissonances and resonances, lapses and excesses of meaning, when the constituent elements of anyone's gender, of anyone's sexuality aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. And I thought, what a brilliant, brilliant um, 
comment that is about the untidiness of our kind of histories and identities and, and you know I think so much of what happens currently is about trying to tidy and resolve and cure um, when perhaps that's not necessary. Anyway, <laughs> right, uh, audience, please, um, over to you. I, we, we started off, I think um, Joseph asked a, a question which um, Nandini responded to, but I don't know, Joseph, if you want to um, ask anything else verbally, or would you like me to maybe just read out what you put? Um, Oh, uh, talk or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Okay, so I had a different question actually, and I noticed that uh, there was a lot of mention of sort of this feeling when you see work by a queer artist that you can sort of know and you feel like comforted by it. And like as a straight man, I have no idea what that sort of sense is. And like, I just wondered if you could kind of elaborate a bit more. Oops, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Gavin you're muted yeah yeah sorry I'm, I was muted there um I think it's really hard to to fully explain what what I mean by that because I'm, I'm also not saying that people who aren't queer don't feel it too um but I think maybe it's it's like an, an accepting that for me um that things that are brightly colored and unusually shaped and um maybe even are about love and kindness and care um to me as a man growing up in a, a male dominated society um i don't think i'm meant to like those things necessarily i think i'm meant to like certain other things and so actually just fully embracing that is probably what i mean by that and so that maybe goes to anyone out there who um just wants to enjoy and embody things that feel I shouldn't say it shouldn't be saying this but feel more feminine um and the reason I'm saying that is because I've been you know we've all been suppressed by what we've identified as masculine so why these things exist in the first place masculine and feminine is an issue and that needs to be resolved but I think that's what it's about it's like trying to break free from um a whole 20 years of my life where you go in the pound shop and it's the blue section and the pink section that's probably what I'm trying to say um, and eventually like embracing that you want to play with all of this stuff you know and you want to enjoy all of it and encourage other people to so. yeah uh, I, if I can just add to that <clears throat> to answer Joe's question um, yeah what Gavin said this kind of you're, you're fearful you've been grown up to imagine that you shouldn't be liking this kind of stuff and for me I actually never chose to do interior design because it was seen back in Kenya as this feminine thing. And I refused to do interior design until I kind of got to grips with my own sexuality. So seeing designers like Karim Rashid, who, who was straight, but creating the most colorful and elaborate, I'm not saying gay is only colorful and elaborate. It's not that, it's, it's kind of this, element of being told you cannot like that because it is feminine that may, boys do not like that so yeah that gives me um a, an an element of joy happiness to kind of see that and accept that really i think for me it's more instinctive it's like when i go down the road and i see a queer person i know we look at each other and just in that little space of looking at each other, it's like, I know you're here and I acknowledge you. I think that's just, I don't know, I can just, uh, uh, it sounds very abstract, but I can, uh, I, I guess I can describe it as a feeling. So something that feels like you feel a sense of kinship, you feel a sense of, you know, and I do feel like, uh, so what happens is that if, uh, because uh, like when you are queer, uh, you are less restrictive. So queerness also means freedom. So you are also less restrictive in your art. 
so there, there are more multiplicities and there are more multitudes in your work. And I'm not, and queerness, I think, more than sexuality, more than, the, I feel like it really means multitudes. We are more than this small, like, gender binary. Yeah. We are so much more than that. I think that's what it means. I, I'm sorry if I sound too abstract, but. No, I mean, I, I think we, we do, um, sexuality is in, the fabrics, the colours, the textures of everything around us and in each other, isn't it? It's, it's in this, and we learn to understand those through our sexuality and the expectations that we have of ourselves from created through our mm -hmm. families, don't we? And I think, you know, just, just talking about colours, talking about textures even and materials, they have a gendered, sexualized sort of relationship to this that we perhaps just don't even realize and I think as designers one of our jobs and artists and, and theorists one of our jobs is to at least reveal those things and, and understand that we are responsible also for perhaps continuing those on if we're not careful you know in a way we have to like realize it unpick it and then start to collaborate that's what that's what needs to be done in order to even yeah so that everything is more accessible um and i mean that can transcend across um sexuality across culture even across class like i i admit that i'm really drawn to like working class artists and and that's because i'm i've come from a working class background and and is that bad is that good i don't know but it's, maybe it's through some sort of solidarity but I think we've got, you have to acknowledge and break down these things before you, you can rebuild them and do them in, in really positive ways as well. I'm just aware we're running out of time. Has anyone got a burning question that they'd like to ask? <coughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, can I just add one more thing before we go and Jane, I'll pass on to you very quickly, is <clears throat> I think we're in a very fortunate position to be kind of educators here uh, and our designers, our students that are kind of being trained to go out into the world, it's being open to such discussions for you guys to even be here and listening to this, you're opening yourselves to a different way of thinking about your design and how like what Gavin and Nandini were saying about these spaces or the projects and products that you're creating, you have the ability to go out and create things for a more inclusive world. So I, I just wanna say thank you to everyone actually for, for opening up your minds to even be here and listening to us. Well, you just stole- Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Cheers for that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I wanted to say exactly the same, but also <laughs> if you're interested um, in ABLE, then uh, please do contact us through the university. We'd love to hear what you've got to say about sexuality and design. Um, and also, I suppose the other thing I wanted to finish with is to say that these discussions aren't just for a month. They're for all time and for everyone. Um, and that's what we'd like to do. So please do, um, if you have things you want to talk about, please do offer it to us at the university. We'd be really happy to hear what you'd like to talk about. Okay, thank you ever so much for attending. Um, it's been great to have you here and thank you so much to the panelists um, and particularly to Nandini um, as our um international new international member of able so thank you i'm humbled <laughs> and thank you jason for inviting me no thank you thank you jane thank, thank you, you Gavin. everyone thank okay. you. thanks everyone okay thanks everyone have a good afternoon bye bye bye, bye. bye.